Welcome everyone to another episode of Real Talk on Racism. I'm your host, Russ Terry, and we have another fantastic guest with us today that I'm super excited for you to hear her insights. Uh, our guest today is, please join me in welcoming Kimberly Tiedekin, uh, Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Princeton University, right here in Princeton, New Jersey. Kimmy, my good friend and former colleague, so good to have you here. Oh, thanks for having me, Russ. I'm so happy to be here. You know this is a subject that is just near and dear to my heart, to my spirit, to my being, so I'm happy to get to chat with it, chat about it with you. Uh, well, I'm happy to get to chat about it with you. And uh, congratulations, first of all, for working in such an important area at an Ivy League school. I'm so proud of you and so happy for you. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be there. You know, we knew, have known each other for maybe decades now, um, and to think about my path and where it's led me. Um, it's just wonderful to be at Princeton. It's a university whose mission I, I agree with. It speaks to my soul, and just to be there and be able to influence and impact is a wonderful opportunity that I love every day. Oh, well. Um, you're doing great work, and you. uh, you're welcome, and we'll dive right into it. So. Uh, you told me, I see, that the university just released its first ever racial equity report. Uh, great stuff. What were some key findings? So Princeton's DEI report focused on three different areas. It was climate, equity and inclusion, access and outreach, and the academic experience. And the report is um, a big deal because it speaks to all of the work that's been going on at Princeton, and Princeton has been doing work in this area for quite some time. Um, Princeton is very outspoken in what it does, so many of you who have been following some of the DACA cases have seen uh, and heard about Princeton. Um, they have done a lot of renaming um, and other efforts around DEI. This report pulls it all together and shares what's been happening across many of our populations. I also feel that the report is an opportunity for us to recognize many of the individuals, hundreds of individuals, students, faculty, staff, who have been working in this area. Um, and I think in the report it shares our progress, but also shares some of the areas that we have to do work. I don't think that this report has um, a, a, a toxic positivity in the way that it, that it shares what's happening in a fashion that's not true. I think it shares the progress, but also tells us that there's much more work to be done and we're not perfect in this area. Oh my gosh, I have so many follow-up questions on all that amazing insight, you rock. Okay, so first of all, I love, 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 love that you said hundreds of people are working on this. I am so passionate that reducing racism, eliminating racism, increasing diversity, increasing equity and inclusion is an all-in initiative that yes. everyone should be working on it. So the fact that hundreds of people at Princeton are involved in this, students, teachers, staff, kudos to all of you out there who are working on this. Uh, much respect um, and props uh, to all of them. Thank you. It takes a village. Um, there's different folks with different perspectives. You know, this, this report is a diversity, equity, and inclusion report. Princeton does a lot around racial equity. Um, and, you know, I know we talk about intersectionality all the time. All of these different dimensions of diversity come together and they matter for our experience. And when you read this, this report, you'll see that it touches on socioeconomic status. It touches on um, where we've come from culturally. It touches on our race and ethnicity. You know, it speaks to a lot of the ERGs, the employee resource groups that we have. And so you can see this holistic view of DEI in this report and the number of diversity practitioners that it takes to move this forward and engage people um, is, is huge. Because I, sometimes when we think about racism and we think about DEI, people think about it from a structural or even an institutional level, but so much of what we do is at that interpersonal level, which means that I have the ability to influence you and to influence that whoever is in my sphere every day. And we need to continue to, to have this energy behind it so that we're all very comfortable working in this space and tackling it a little bit at a time. Mm, great stuff. Um, 
All right, so we're going to talk about the progress and the room for improvement. So let's go with the progress first. What are two or three examples of the progress that Princeton University has made in recent years on the DEI front? Yeah, so I work in the Office of Human Resources, so I tend to think about this first and foremost from a staff perspective. When I think about DEI with regard to the staff, it's about how we're engaging people daily. So some of the... Um, uh, some of the um, actions that have been done at Princeton that I want to share with you are, first and foremost, the ERGs. We think about ERGs, or employee resource groups, and you know there's this evolution of them. So they started as these affinity groups where people who had very specific and, and like backgrounds would get together, and they've evolved to become these resource groups that help people who, are, uh, who find commonality in experience and also in their identities. So Princeton now has 11 of these employee resource groups, 11, which is a huge number. It's wonderful. And there's over 1,500 employees who are members of these resource groups. And again, it's not just the folks whose identity is in the title. It's open to allies. It's open to folks who are interested, people who want to know more. The growth of those ERGs, the funding of them, the engagement of our staff is a huge accomplishment because it helps to set the tone for the inclusion that we want to see at Princeton. So I love that even through the pandemic, these ERGs have continued to go strong and we continue to reach more people. Oh my gosh. So uh, 11 ERGs. So I mean, I, can, I can't even think of 11. So I want you to tell me. All right. So I'm guessing, you know, like a black employees network, Latino, uh, Asian, women, LGBT. Um, veterans. And, oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, okay. Keep going. Yes, what yes. are some of the others? So veterans. There's a Princeton social professionals. There's international. We have our Asian staff at Princeton, Princetonian, uh, Latino Princetonians. There's the Princetonians of Color Network, the um, Association of uh, African American Males. I mean, there are so many ERGs that we have here at Princeton. And our employees never hesitate to sign up for them. Um, you'll be seeing them at the Tiger Trot. We focus our ERGs on our ability to engage our own staff at Princeton. We think about how we are going to um, create service opportunities within the greater Princeton community. We think about education for ourselves. Um, and we think about our professional development. So when you are picturing DEI in a workplace, these are the pillars that really matter to allow our staff to show up and feel like they're included, to feel like they belong, and to feel like they matter at Princeton. So I'm really proud of the, the continued effort with our ERGs. Excellent, because I would imagine Princeton is one of the bigger employers here in the state of New Jersey. So hopefully other people watching who live here in Jersey in the Princeton area or otherwise are inspired to uh, create um, uh, ERGs at their company. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Uh, what would you say is um, one or two of the areas for improvement that the university still needs to make? Yeah. So what I love about Princeton is that it continues to leverage the trustees, to, to, to listen to the students, to listen to the employees, to tap into the staff, to understand what they have to do. Um, Princeton is continuing to focus on its history and looking at what has happened on its campus and around its campus to understand the impact that it has to employees uh, and, and just to the general community. So I think that there's a continued opportunity for Princeton to look at that, which it's already doing. That's really wonderful. Um, if you're looking at the report, this report shares some data. So there are charts within this report that speak to um, the level of inclusion that its different populations are feeling. So for Princeton staff, you'll see that different populations feel differently about their sense of belonging at Princeton. There's always an opportunity for us to continue to ask for that data, for us to continue to tap into our staff and understand what it is that helps them to feel included and where are the spaces that they're not feeling included so that we can understand how to address that. So there's a lot of work still to be done. I don't think that DEI or racism or bias is something that one day we're gonna say this, this doesn't exist. Um, we're humans, we, we have bias in the way that we exist. So I think it's always going to be an opportunity for us to double down on um, our education and on our inclusion and when I say that, I'm not just thinking about 
certain populations, right? I don't think this is just education for black people or white people or Latinx people. I think that we have to be intentional about providing that education for everyone, every single person. Yeah, and you know, part of the mission of this show is that education piece that hopefully people watching learn something through all these episodes and all the amazing guests uh, like yourself and all the great wisdom that you and others have shared. You're welcome. Uh, so we're here today with uh, Kimberly Tiedekin, Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Princeton University. And uh, you mentioned it a few minutes ago, but I want to go back to it, intersectionality. So in case anybody doesn't know what intersectionality is, I, I know, but I looked up the Oxford Dictionary definition so I could share it with you. All right. So. Intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categories such as race, class, and gender, creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So how has intersectionality shown up in your life, being a woman and a person of color? Yeah, so when I, I want to address the definition that you shared first. Please, go so for I it. So I know that um, Kimberly Crenshaw coined that, that definition and talked about intersectionality, that, that's hers. And the definition that you state is right. And when I think about it, I don't always think about it in terms of just disadvantages. I always think about mm -hmm. intersectionality in alignment with this concept of privilege and power. There are times where my um, different identities will give me a disadvantage, but there's also times where I have a clear advantage due to them also. So I am a woman. I am a woman of color. I am a special needs mom. I am the daughter of a blind man. Um, I have so many different elements that give me privilege. There are times where I may be able to get through to someone differently or pick up on their cultural, on, on the nuances of their experience due to the intersections of, of who I am. There are, are also times where I will be disadvantaged um, in a situation because I am a woman of color. Um, if I think about where it comes up, at times when you're working in diversity, equity, and inclusion, there are dimensions of diversity that are more comfortable for us. So maybe you're more comfortable thinking about women or maybe you're more comfortable thinking about you know, another dimension of diversity. Even when I'm in a room full of w women, my experience could be very different than theirs based on the element of me being a person of color or any of the other elements that I spoke to you about. What it means for me is that it's an opportunity for me to always share additional insight into the nuances of, of who I am and of what that means for my experience. In addition, though, it means that there will be times where I'm in a room with other people and I won't have a full understanding as to what they've experienced. You know, I think that we're the student and the teacher in all situations. And the way that intersectionality just kind of plays into that is huge. It means that we'll never know fully someone else's experience, even if you think you have a really large element in common with them. Mm. Well, uh, a couple of things. I love, love, love that you spoke about the advantages uh, in addition. Shame on me for just going to the disadvantages, but I think, um, as you know, I'm a hopeful and positive person, yes. so I appreciate you helping me um, be hopeful and positive even when talking about intersectionality, so thank you for that. Thanks, Chris. And I love that you smiled even talking about some of the challenges that you've experienced, and we've uh, I've noticed that with other guests that we've had, um, both women of color specifically that I'm thinking of, and it's almost like if I'm observing it right, you can talk about something challenging that happened without getting up visibly upset, angry, et cetera, about it. Is that A, accurate, and B, a conscious choice on your part? Yes, so yes, it's accurate. And yes, it's a choice. When things happen, I have the choice with regard to how I respond. I used to just react. When something happened, it would trigger me, and it's very easy to fall into that confirmation bias and say, oh, I know what this is. I know all about it. This has happened before. It's, you know, you kind of go down this rabbit hole. Listen, 
Some things stink. It is not fun when certain things happen. But if I choose to let something ruin my entire day, then that's on me. And that affects the way that I get to impact others that I might run into that day. There are days when I hit my boundaries, like when I think back to some of the shootings that have happened. I've, I've had days as well where I'm just like, enough is enough, today is a day I need to respect my own mental health, I'm gonna go home and read a book, you know, do whatever I need to do to just kind of re re rejuvenate myself. Um, and that's fine, um, but I think that we get to to choose how we react in certain situations. So I actually want to switch to the personal side, and I'm grateful to you for feeling comfortable sharing this. So I know you have a multicultural family and uh, having biracial kids. Um, what are the challenges that of uh, challenges? and advantages, to use your wisdom from earlier in the show, uh, the challenges and advantages that come with having biracial kids. Yeah, so just for some insight, you know I'm five foot two, brown <laughs> chick, uh, married to a six foot seven white guy. So we are uh, very, very different when you first look at us. Um, and I have two very tall, tan children. I have a six-year-old who's neurotypical, and I have a four-year-old with special needs. My family is a wonderful opportunity of learning and of growth all the time, all the time. It is difficult and it is fun and, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. When I think about my family, it has advantages because I come from a multicultural family already into my family now. It means that I always have a different perspective that I've been opened to. I have lots of people that I can speak with when I wanna understand how someone else might be coming at a situation. It means that I have the ability to have exposure to many different cultures, religions, backgrounds. There are huge advantages to this. It means that I also get to understand why I should give people the benefit of the doubt as much as I can. Right? We all have these instances where we open our mouths and insert our foot, and it doesn't always mean that there's bad intent. Is the impact the same? Yes, sometimes the impact is the same. But I think that being in this family, it gives me an extra perspective on why it's so important to reach across to people who may not have been familiar, who may not have had something on their radar, so that we can grow with each other and, and, and learn to be better. Does it have disadvantages? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, sometimes it does. Um, there's a lot of education that has to happen. You know, there's all these conversations around not putting the weight of education on the shoulders of people of color, you know, women, et cetera. And when that can happen, that's great. But sometimes when you have those relationships with people, you are the one who can get through. You are the one who can have that conversation. And that means that you're opting in to taking on some of that weight. And you have to do it with grace. And you should do it with love. It takes a lot of patience. I talk, talked about boundaries earlier. There are days where I don't want to have to explain something. But if I do not explain it, then what will the impact be later? There's a lot of teaching that goes on in my family. I must teach others how to advocate for my sons. I must teach my husband how to advocate for me. Mm. And when you see the 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 cost of that being in your time and your energy, um, it makes it all worth it when that person stands up for you later. When I'm enabling and empowering my family to be better allies, like that's, that's what it's all about. Mm. My gosh, I'm taking copious notes of everything you're mm. saying, which, uh, you know, so much great wisdom. Um, there's this phrase that I use sometimes called inclusion exhaustion. You know, the exhaustion that many people of color or black women face from this educating of others on the things that others say that are microaggressions, culturally insensitive, et cetera. So I give you and so many other uh, black women so much credit because, mm -hmm. you know, in addition to having an incredible busy job, that's an incredible job, and being a mom of two and having special needs, uh, you know, in that mix, and being a wife, and being a daughter, and a friend, and all of that, you know, now you have to add 
uh, anti-racism educator to the list. So uh, first, I want to pause and give you so much credit for those moments where you do educate others on uh, the things that they say or do. Oh my gosh. So I appreciate that. And I want to also share that same credit to the people who have educated me. Mm. I work in DEI. I am a diversity practitioner. I have had instances where I have straight up opened my mouth and put my foot in it. I've said the wrong thing. And other people have educated me. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, um, when all of the marriage equality act activity was happening, um, I remember planning a panel discussion. And there was a brochure that was going on, and the way that the language was coming out was that we were referring to it as gay marriage. Mm. Now, when you think about that term, you can understand how it plants the seed mm. that there is not equality in marriage because you are separating just the general term of marriage from this, you know, air quotes, gay marriage. And I, as the planner of this, was saying it and saying it and saying it. And finally, someone pulled me aside, one of my colleagues, and said, hey, I, I just want to give you some better language to use. You are saying gay marriage the whole time, and I'm going to suggest or invite you to use the term marriage equality because, and we went into this whole um, conversation so that I could understand the impact of the messaging in the words that I was saying. And then, you know, once you have those conversations, you always have to think about um, the anxiety that we go through when we realize that we had a misstep. You have to think about how you're going to continue to build that relationship with someone. There's a risk that went into that person correcting me and educating me. Without that person who I'm still very close with, I would continue to do the wrong thing, right? Not bad intentions, but just doing the wrong thing. So I think that that education goes across multiple dimensions of diversity, and I want to call out um, or, or maybe give a shout out to all of the people who educate others, even when it's people of color educating other people of color, white people educating people of color, like all across the board, it matters. Well, that's such a fantastic point, and uh, I've been on both sides of that. Um, where I've been the one educating somebody, but also the one who got educated. And I know um, uh, one example that I'm thinking of is I said male nurse. And my friend, who's so amazing, was like, you know, you don't need to say male nurse. You can just say nurse, Russ. And that stuck with me, even though that was probably 10 or 15 years ago that she said it. So uh, I think when we handle things with grace and in a calm way and the words you use that that person said to you, I invite you to, or can I share something? You know, they didn't attack you. They mm -hmm. did it in a graceful and respectful way. And uh, I love when we interact with others as human beings like that because there's so much negativity, you know, on social media and, you know, people will fire off emails that when we can speak to each other in a calm yes. way, you know, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. So I think that's a great way to, uh, for anybody to interact. Yeah. Can I can I call out one thing? Please go so for it. One of the things that you loved is I know I had this story that stuck with me, and you clearly had a story that stuck with you. Sometimes I like to pay attention to the emotions that make those things stick. I talk about it in terms of a bowling ball going down a bowling alley. So we are this ball, we're kind of going forward on our way, and there's this opportunity for us to fall into the gutter and kind of get canceled, right? But it's the bumpers, the people who act as the bumpers on our lane allow us to keep going to reach our, our path. I like to call that out because I think sometimes when you're in those interactions, if you are the ball and you hit that bumper, it doesn't always feel so great for the ball or for the bumper. There's that little momentary rub that makes that story stick with us. Um, so I like to pay attention to the negative feelings and the anxiety that sometimes happens to tell folks that that's okay, that's normal. Embrace that discomfort and keep it moving because that is that is the the glue that helps us to build more solid relationships, even though it costs us a little bit to do that. Yeah, and I know that feeling, the like blood rushes to your head kind of feeling in a bad way, like, oh crap, what did I do? And I would never want to offend this person or anybody else. Uh, but then there's also some, some gratitude that this person had the courage to uh, speak to us in a respectful way to share um, a different point of view. And I think exactly what you said, when we have the bad feeling, 
and that motivates or inspires us to change our behavior and to use this new language going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. My gosh. So much great stuff. Um, so uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so what are some final thoughts uh, from you for our viewers, uh, things that they can do if they're seeing this episode and inspired to take action at work, take action in their personal life or otherwise? Yeah. Um, what I always advise people to do is easy. Go out and educate yourself, read books, but then make new friends. Make new friends. Have conversations that you wouldn't ordinarily have. When I study, when I read, I learn about these concepts, but it's really when I get a chance to put them into action in real life that they stick. You know, it's like if someone gives you directions versus kind of driving there yourself. So continue to go out, find a book, find an article, find a video, and read about something. But then I challenge folks to go out and make friends, meet new people, put themselves outside of their comfort zones to talk about it. I'm doing a project um, right now at Princeton where we're connecting our staff with people and we're giving them a list of questions and they're spending time interviewing each other. So I'd ask you a question for you know, a few minutes, you would ask me questions for a few minutes and then we would connect and just talk about all of, all of the things that we just discussed when we were just listening. The connections and the new perspectives are, are creating such impact because now when you leave, you know, you'll be able to interpret a story in a different way. You'll have another person to call upon when you want to figure out how to handle something or you want to role play what to say or maybe just ask for, for, for better language. And so the biggest thing that I do is challenge people to go out and expand your network and meet someone new so that you can form your own point of view um, through this experience called life. Well, great wisdom. Uh, Kimberly Tiedekin, Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Princeton University. So happy for you and proud of you. We were junior HR managers when we worked together like 10, 15 years ago. Just so to see how you've risen in your career, uh, it's been amazing to watch. And uh, I uh, am grateful I got to, that uh, I got to and our viewers got to hear all your wisdom today. Oh my goodness, Russ, thank you for your positivity. I think you've always been just a positive um, and very high impact spirit. And I'm so happy to, to know you and have you in my life and to be able to um, do this with you today. Thank you for your allyship, your friendship, and your guidance all the time. Don't make me cry, Kimmy, I'm still on TV. <laughs> that was beautiful, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, and thank you for watching Real Talk on Racism. For all of us here, our executive producer, Nick Mellis, I'm Russ Terry, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.